الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ وسلم علی نبی محمد و علیہ و صحبہ و سلم مبع Continuing on in our dars, our lesson, uh, our study of the book Usul al-Sunnah by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimahullah ta'ala a very important book in Ittiqad I wanted to, this is the third lesson and I wanted to make this a bit of a review and bring in some fawaid or some benefits from some of our ulama like Shaykh Abdulaziz al-Rajihi wa ghayrihim hafadahumullah ta'ala Imam Ahmed said, as we've already covered in the first and second dars, قال إمام أحمد رسول السنة عندنا تمسك بما كان عليه أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم واقتدابهم وترك البدع وكل بدعة فهي ضلالة وترك الخصومات وجلوس مع مع أصحاب الأهواء وترك المراء والجدال وخصومات في الدين والسنة عندنا قال إمام أحمد رحمه الله تعالى أصول السنة عندنا that the the foundation or the foundations of the sunnah in the Ahlul Hadith in to the people of Ahlul Sunnah imams like Imam Ahlul Sunnah Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal رحمه الله تعالى and the other imams as well from Abu Hanifa Imam Shafi'i wa Imam Malik to Imam Ahmed rahimahumullah jami'an and those imams who came after them all the way up until our time that they found the foundation of the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the foundation of the sunnah is this compilation so to speak of what forms the foundation of our creed and the foundation of our methodology in understanding Islam and propagating Islam. And he said, in what forms this, this methodology? He said, the, the, the foundations of the Sunnah is adhering to what the companions of the Prophet وسلم, were upon and adhering to it sternly or firmly and avoiding bid'ah innovation in the religion and that every innovation is misguidance everything that doesn't come from kitab illa wa sunnah to rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een and doesn't doesn't isn't cannot be associated or or does not come from them or stem from those nasus from what is considered dalil in the shari sharia then that is an innovated matter. And of course, this is referring, as Imam Ahmed mentioned, in the end, after he, he mentioned that leaving Ahla Bid'ah, the people of innovation, leaving innovation, and that all of it is misguidance, leaving argumenting and debating and dis discordance regarding the religion. And as he said, regarding the religion, he said, Fiddin, meaning that it doesn't... This is not, when we refer to bid'ah and innovation, we're not referring to anything that is new. But bid'ah here that we're, we're referring to, and that is bid'ah lohui. But what we're referring to here is bid'ah in the, in the religion, especially regarding the aqidah, a cre uh, the creed in Islam and the methodology or minhaj of giving da'wah. And that these things are restricted to the maratib of adillah that we mentioned before, the evidences, the different levels of evidence. We mentioned four. The Qur'an is evidence. So if someone asks you, what's your proof for saying that? The Qur'an, if it comes from the Qur'an. Or it comes from the sunnah, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or thirdly, it comes from, it comes from the ijma, from the consensus of the ulama, and especially when it comes to creed, general, when we refer to ijma, we're talking about what the earliest generations, like the sahaba, radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een, what they were upon. Because the sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we already covered, they did not differ in creed. 
Like some of them did not deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine attributes, whereas others affirmed it. No. Some of them did not say, uh, Astawa ala arsh, you know, ar-Rahman rose above the throne. They did not refer to that as a stola, as the Asha'ira do, and many of the other groups of this time that come from the Aqidah of the Asha'ira, that they, they say. Or some of them did not say Allah is everywhere, where others said, no, he's, he's with us uh, in helping us and assisting us and supporting us, and he is with us by, he, he sees everything and he hears everything. Uh, and he has knowledge of everything. Some did not say that, whereas another group of the Sahaba would say, no, uh, Allah is everywhere. No, absolutely not. But the Sahaba to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they affirmed what Allah affirmed about himself and what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam affirmed about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that is what they were upon. So the Sahaba did not have disagreement. They did not disagree over uh, affairs of Aqidah and as we mentioned as Sheikh uh, Sheikh Abayda Jabari Rahimah uh, Hafidhullah Ta'ala mentioned in his explanation in regards to that in Masail uh, al or uh, possibly this may have been Sheikh Ashatri Sheikh Nasser Ashatri Hafidhullah Ta'ala that he mentioned in issues of Furu those issues which are branches of the main issues that in these situations you had uh, disagreements with the companions عنهم, meaning issues of fiqh generally G issues that might have been related to fiqh issues related to jurisprudence uh, and, and so forth maybe on uh, different um, ways in which uh, you know extend for example in the hadith Abu Huraira عنه, he used to uh, extend his wudu because he heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that uh, that verily my ummah will be you know they will have light on their limbs on the places traces of light on their limbs the places where they made wudu so whoever amongst you is able to increase his light then he should do he should do so so Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu from his ijtihad he differed with other companions in that he used to, but he wouldn't do this in public. Some saw him do this. That he he would extend his wudu up to his uh, his shoulders. And that was from his ijtihad. He was rewarded, one reward for that. But that was not correct. That was not the, uh, the, the correct way of making the wudu. So we should not follow Abu Huraira in that and he's rewarded he gets ajr from Allah because that was how he understood that nas but instead we would go with the strongest view which is in accordance with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam regarding that issue so showing us that in that issue Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu from his ijtihad he differed slightly with the other companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in in extending the wudu and so he would extend it all the way when washing his arm to his shoulders. And that shows us that the Sahaba, that in issues of fiqh and some, you know, furur, fideen, that they had some differences. And that brings about a lot of why, of why we see regarding the madhab, madhahib, of the, the, the madhab of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, with Imam Shafi'i, with Imam. Uh, Malik and Imam Ahmed that we see differences in, in issues of fiqh we see differences in issues of fiqh so the companions and that is one of the levels of, of evidence as we mentioned the consensus then the fourth level that we uh, mentioned prior to this lesson is that is qiyas is uh, analogy by making analogy from uh, other nusus from other text by looking at a text and making an analogy to make a, a, a ruling about something and we'll talk more in depth in our next lesson about uh, Qiyas then he said uh, and and leaving so leaving every innovation and every innovation is uh, Balala, because innovation here again we're talking about innovation regarding the religion meaning especially in creed in creed and fiqh and everything that is an innovation 
There's no new way to make wudu. However, there might be new tools to make wudu. Now we have the showers and we have uh, the way our sinks. That is not the bid'ah that is referred to that is mithmum here, that is uh, disliked and muharram. But the bid'ah we're talking about here, for example, if someone says, I want to increase the number of raka'at during prayer. Okay, they want to increase Maghrib. They say, hey, I don't feel that's complete enough. Three rakat. I want to complete it. I want to complete it and make it um, make it four. What does that hurt? It doesn't hurt anybody. I'm increasing the good. No, that is a bid'ah. And that is uh, rejected. As the Prophet wasallam said in an authentic hadith, Men uh, athatha. <laughs> Whoever innovates in this affair of ours will have it rejected. Whoever uh, whoever does uh, an action in 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 the religion which is not which is not from the religion, then he will have it rejected. Letting us know that starting a bidah or continuing a bidah. Both of them are methmoon. Both of them are impermissible in Islam. So stick to the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Ijma, and Qiyas Sahih for your evidences regarding Islam. And another point that brings up is also a thing where often we have some of our brothers and sisters do usually to a lack of knowledge, and because all of many of us. Many of us are in positions where we have to blind follow because we don't have the language, the linguistic tools, you know, with the Arabic language, and we don't have the ability to go into the books, nor to take from the scholars or, or what have you. And even if some of us are able to do some of those things, still not really to be able to go into those Messiah and, and so forth, and definitely not the level of Ijtihad. So a lot of us are in a situation where we have to make some taqlid, some blind following of sound scholars, scholars that are known for their sunnah. But we have to know a, a very important thing, that that is not dalil. So whenever you might have a fatwa from one of our mashaykh that we love, saying about so-and-so or saying about such and such issue, again, and he's bringing evidence from kitab and sunnah, that if his fatwa is in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. You know, and it's supported by that. And and the understanding that he is coming up from the Quran and the Sunnah, from those Dalil, or from the Ijma, or what have you, is Sahih, or Qiyas Sahih, that is sound, then we accept that. Then it is a, a Hujjah. But in and of itself, you cannot say Sheikh Fulan said, and that is Dalil. That is not Dalil. We, no matter who, who we love from our Mashaykh, from the Mashaykh that passed before us and the Mashaykh that are living today. And the Mashaykh that are living today are nothing compared to the Salaf. They're nothing compared to the Salaf in knowledge, in understanding, in closeness to the Prophet Wasallam and the earliest generations, absolutely not, or in their Fadl. But we love them all because they all help us to understand Islam and come closer to practicing, uh, come closer to uh, to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala by practicing kitabillah wa sunnah al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and calling us to that and reminding us of that. So we love them all. We love Ahl al-Ilm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَنَا أَخْشَى ibadi al ulama," or that the most, uh, the most God-fearing people from amongst my slaves is the ulama, is the scholars. Okay, so they're the most, they, the, they have the most taqwa, showing us that ilm is a sabil to taqwa, and that we should strive to, uh, strive to have taqwa and strive to have ilm, to know, to have fiqh fi deen. So again, those are the four maratib of adillah, and every bid'ah is an innovation. So every, inno, uh, every bid'ah, uh, every innovation is misguidance. Every innovation that has to do with the religion, again. So if someone has a, some sort of new aqidah, new creed, for example, now the way the people put faith in democracy, for example, they believe that uh, in Muslim countries and Muslim lands and wherever, that democracy in and of itself is a uh, is not just sanctioned by Allah, they believe that it is, some of them believe it's superior. And, and, and so forth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen. Those people have disbelieved. They have disbelieved. Because 
there's nothing similar to or greater than the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is from the deen of, uh, of Allah. That's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen. And this is what Imam Ahmed was upon and what the Salaf of this Ummah was upon. But this is a newly invented matter in that, yes, democracy has some roots from those uh, from ancient uh, uh, Greek societies and, and so forth, from the ancient societies. However, the way it is practiced now and the way people hold it as a almost an aqidah that they want the freedom to for a man to marry a man they want the freedom in egypt to protest they want the freedom in, in libya to um uh for women to you know do do whatever to to marry another woman or to uh you know do this and that and the other and and, and we see this spreading all around the world this uh liberalism and this free ideology but this is a bid'ah in ittiqad regarding creed and we should never be fearful of, of calling it what it is. It is an innovation in creed. And it is so dangerous. Why? Because people believe that stuff. Their freedoms and freedoms that they believe that are inherent to them. They believe that to be superior to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed. They don't even want to deal with what's in the Quran and the Sunnah anymore. Wa'iyadhan billah min dhalika. So we have to know that all bid'ah. No matter whether it's in creed, whether it's in um, jurisprudence, whether it's in whatever related to the religion, leads you astray. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and all, uh, uh, and all misguidance leads to the fire. And who from amongst us wants to go to the hellfire? Then Imam Ahmed said, also, leaving debating about the religion and leaving sitting with the people of desires so it is not befitting for a believer to sit with people who hold those ideologies and to sit with those people who don't want to uh to 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 practice the religion in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah of the uh, Messenger of Allah وسلم, and the understanding of the Sahaba so it wouldn't be befitting for someone of Ahl Sunnah to sit and sit with a, a, a Shia Rafidi Somebody who curses the companions, because it's as if this one is cursing uh, the hold the rope which ties the other person to the sources in the religion, which is the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum majma'in. And it wouldn't be befitting for some of Ahl Sunnah to sit with people who believe that take asceticism outside of the bounds of Islam. They they want to go beyond what the Prophet did. والسلام, the Prophet ﷺ did not sit in a dark room and, you know, say Allah, 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 Allah until spit came out of his mouth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there are some people, they do this and they believe they're coming closer to, the, to Allah. Do they know better than the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If he didn't do it, that shows us it's not mashroor and it's not a way of coming closer to Allah, but instead it brings you further from Allah. Why? Because you're going on a sabil ghayr mu'minin. You're going on a way which is away from the path of the believers. So from sitting with Ahl Hawa, the people of desires and the people of bid'ah, and from, from uh, sitting and debating with people about the religion, this is very important, uh, and, and and the reason for this, the hikmah behind this, is for leaving the people who are ignorant. Because as I believe it's a author of Imam Malik, he said, I never debated someone who was ignorant except for that he beat me. And I never debated someone who was uh, a person of intellect and intelligence. I mean, a person who knew the Sharia except that I overtook him. Why? Because a person of ignorance, they have no bounds. They pull out things from here, they pull out things from there, and they use their desires. So you're not even playing by the same tools. If you're restricting your arguments to the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the Salaf, then that is where you're going back to. But the person who, who doesn't know Quran and Sunnah, they bring their hujjah, they say, well, philosopher so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said this. And President so and so said this, and the par parliament, the great uh, historian said this. Instead of going back to the sources, how can you debate someone like that? Because you don't even hold the same, uh, you don't even have the same arena that you're dealing with. 
So this person's going to come from their desires and they set their own boundaries. Where your boundaries, you're talking about the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in accordance with the Salaf of this Ummah. Also, it's very important, one of the reasons the ulama, they discourage debating with Ahla Bid'a with Jahl and the people of desires is because for several reasons. One of the things, so is not to expose the other people to the doubts. So for example, if you sit and you debate an Ashari, you guys say, okay, hey, we're going to have a debate this Saturday and it's going to be at such and such masjid or whatever. You sit up there with the Ashari. Depending on your level of knowledge and the level of, of that person and how articulate they are and how articulate you are, that could possibly be the one of the factors that determine the bait. Not the haq, not the truth, but it, it perhaps this person is very good with their tongue and you're not. This person is very good in, argu in argument, in, in argumentation, you're not. For example... I, to, 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 to have people try to challenge someone like, especially in our community, because we have a tradition in the African-American community of good speakers. And those spe speakers come, they're training. Even the Muslims, they have a, a, a training or a route of going back from the African-American preachers. To debate some of those people or to debate somebody, for example, like Louis Farrakhan, very articulate, very intelligent, very well experienced. Your arena is not even going to be the same for one. His, not only his, his uh, charisma and so forth could be mesmerized and confuse the people and that he possibly might even beat you in your argumentation, but you're not, your, your arena is not the same. You're talking about the Quran. You're talking about the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the understanding of the Sahaba. He doesn't even want to hear that. He's going to talk about the Bible. He's going to talk about this. So you're really not even in the same arena. You're not even talking and having a discussion about the same things. So your boundaries are not the same. You haven't set any um, any borders and, and, and for the discussion. And the realm of the discussion is, is entirely different. The second thing is that you will give the opportunity for that person from Ahl Bida or Ahl Ahwa to spread their Shubahat to the people who are listening. So perhaps even if you beat them, their ideals will now be spread with the people. And maybe the people have weak hearts. And some of them, most of the people judge by how they feel. Not because, of, not due to their necessarily their intellectual, necessarily to intellectual uh, discourse or argumentation. But they make judgments by their desires. So then, maybe their move, they just like the way it sounds. And this feels good. This is what they've experienced. So then they go with that. So then now you've allowed, even if you won the debate, you've allowed that opportunity to spread a false aqidah or a false creed, a false belief, a false minhaj to spread amongst the people. So it's a way of protecting yourself and it's a way of protecting the community. And this was the methodology of the Salaf. This is what the Salaf were upon. There are so many athar, so many statements of the Salaf where they... Um, they uh, uh, refused and 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 um, discouraged uh, debating, and this is one of the statements. Is this statement of Imam Ahmed who said, khasumat ma ashab al ahwa mira jidal khasumat As he said, Rahimullah Taala, leaving debating, leaving sitting with the people of desires, and leaving off. Um, you know, continuing uh, to uh, to support opinions and statements and argument, making argumentation uh, based on falsehood. You know, leaving all of those things in order to uh, in order to support yourself. So this is what some of the mashayikh they say that mira mira, for example, that this is to continue to uh, uh, to continue to have uh, jidal. To have um, like uh, argument, argumentative uh, discourse with the aim of supporting yourself. So this is very clear as, as many of us have, have done this in, in our lives and, and, po and possibly in Islam, may Allah forgive us. Where you're in a discussion with someone, you're in an argument with someone and you just say something 
just to support yourself because at, at this point it becomes so personal that you you're you're not really tied to the discussion or you're trying not trying to get to the truth but you just want to make sure that you come out okay or that you win in the argument this is what is called uh, uh mira al mira and this is also sinful and mithmoom and 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 what the salaf hated in order to argue just to support yourself. So you can see all the different reasons why having arguments and debates and things like this uh, are discouraged in Islam. Not meaning that it's totally forbidden. There are times, there are times, and the Salaf did have times, but there are conditions, and we'll talk about those conditions a little bit later. Sheikh Ubaid outlines those conditions, Hafizullah Ta'ala, very extensively in his uh, explanation of this book. So it's very important for us to stay away from those things in order not to spread shubahat, in order not to uh, it to become so personal that we're just defending ourselves instead of having our, our role to, to spread the truth, to want to get to the truth, and also to protect ourselves from and, and, and in order to support the truth so that way um, in case a person is not very articulate. Maybe they have the knowledge, but they're not very articulate. And they're unable to defend the truth and articulate the truth in a way to where this person of desires is, is more articulate and they overtake this person. So then it appears that falsehood has overtaken khair and, and, and the haq. And this is a very dangerous thing. So this is why it is discouraged. And a point I want to mention, I heard Sheikh Abdul Masin al-Abad, Hafizullah Ta'ala in one of the, the lectures, mention someone asked about uh, debating on the internet. So this is relevant to us because many people also get into these kind of discussions on the internet. And he said, leave it as well, going with this qawaid of Ahl Sunnah. And again, remember that when we're talking about Usul Sunnah, we're talking about qawaid, we're talking about principles of Ahl Sunnah. If you want to call yourself a person of Ahl Sunnah, then you need to know what it means to be from Ahl Sunnah. What does it mean? What does it mean to be Sunni? What does it mean to be Salafi? What does it mean to follow the Madhab of the Salaf? What does it mean to follow the Minhaj of the Salaf? What does it mean to be from Ahl Hadith? What does it mean for, to be from Ahl Athar? You need to have an idea what that means. That means going back to these principles that Imam Ahmed is saying. So staying away from those things. Getting back to what I was saying is that the Sheikh was asked about debating on the internet and he mentioned those very same things. He said, hey, that if, he said what means, uh, that if, uh, he said, this is discouraged because perhaps for the very same reason that I said, that a person might not be that articulate on the internet. The person from Ahl Sunnah and the person from Ahl Bidah might be very articulate. So then falsehood is, is aided over the truth. And this is, you know, even when I, I get sometimes challenged by certain, by Shia, I've had Shia, you know, you know, try to debate me in this, uh, you know, I want to debate you on pal talk, and I, w I would never waste my time with these people. And even the people, and some of them, the, the, the uh, Ahbash, they send videos to me, make a takfir of the great scholars of Islam, like Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and other, other than them, and, and spreading their bid'ah. I, I would never waste my time even listening to that garbage. That is garbage. I mean, it's not even befitting. I can't even give it any Islamic respect. I have to call it garbage. I have to call it what it is that it, it would be a waste of time and there would be no benefit to listen to Ahl Bidah. I don't need to. Alhamdulillah, Ahl Sunnah Mawjood. The books are here. We have the books of the Salaf, the, this Ummah. We can go to the books. We can go to the explanations of the early scholars and the later scholars and we can benefit. So there's no reason to go outside of that realm, even for the sake, sake of debating and argument. I would never waste my time, but instead... I try to spread the, the da'wah to Ahl Sunnah so that it hurts them every time. And it hurts them. I find that uh, even if you praise the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, I've made videos about Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, and then you get people, they dislike it and they hate it. Even they'll make comments and they'll curse her, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So this hurts Ahl Bidah more than wasting your time debating. A lot of times the debate, it may even hurt the truth. Or the truth is going to stand strong in and of itself, but it may hurt the case for the truth in the eyes of the people. So it may cause harm to the people. So that's what we have to be cautious of. And that's why these principles are imperative to adhere to. And then, 
in addition to leaving those things, we also have to re realize again, as Imam Ahmed said, and it's uh, very beautiful and imperative. You know, so as he he said, that this is usul sunnah indana. This is the uh, these are the the kawaid and principles, the foundations of ahl sunnati wal jamaa. To ahl sunnah, to these imams, imams of ahl sunnah. So this is what we adhere to, bi idnillah taala. Regarding bid'ah, I just wanted to read a few statements from Sheikh uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz al Raji in his explanation. He said, "Amma sunnah, fihi did did al bid'ah. Wal bid'ah here al hadith fi din kama qala Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam fi hadith sahih. Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fi warad fi fi kulli hadith fi din fi huwa bid'ah." Shaykh Abdulaziz al Raji, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, mentioned in his explanation of Asul Sunnah, he said, As for the Sunnah, he said, then it is the exact opposite of Bid'ah. It is in exact opposition to Bid'ah. That they are on the opposite, it's polemic, or they are in exact contra contradiction or in opposition to one another. That Bid'ah. And Sunnah and Bid'ah, they clash. They're the opposite, inherently. So, with that being said, then the Imam said, the Sheikh said, he said, well, Bid'ah here. He said, Bid'ah, it is, you know, bringing something new in the religion. Bringing something new that has no, and we explained that uh, in our prior lecture a bit more extensively, so we'll leave it at that instead of being repetitive. Uh, and then he said, similar to this, that it came in the hadith, and the hadith that we already mentioned, whoever innovates in this affair of ours, then what, that is not, that which is not from, from it, will have it rejected. And this is a statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a sound, authentic hadith. So then the Shaykh said, and every hadith, every bid'ah, or every newly invented thing in the religion, then it is bid'ah. And meaning it's re rejected. Then he explained what Sunnah is. Well, Sunnah ma thabata an Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam qawlan or fa'lan or taqriran. Wa qad takun Sunnah wajiba. Wa qad takun mustahabba. Wa qad takun fardan wa aslan. Fa Sunnah ma thabata an Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in qawl or fa'l or taqrir. So the Sheikh said, "Hafid Allah Taala." He said, "Then the Sunnah." This is what has been affirmed on the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his statements, from his actions, from the things that he allowed or agreed to. And Sunnah, by using this term in the way that we use it, it can mean something that is an obligation sometimes. Sunnah can also be something meant as uh, mustahab, as we always, as we use it generally, and a lot of the fuqaha, they use it Especially the later generations, uh, closer to our time, use sunnah to, to mean like extra prayers like the nawafil. For example, if you say sunnah, the sunnah of fajr, meaning the two rakat uh, units of prayer before the fajr prayer. So that right there is, a, is, is showing us what is common use of the sunnah, but sunnah is, is much broader than that. It is much more encompassing that, that it can include those things which are an obligation and it can include, include those things which are uh, recommended. As well as uh, fard, those things which are and also an obligation. Uh, or those things which are uh, from the foundation of the religion. That can also refer to the sunnah. And as Imam Ahmed used sunnah and, and the early scholars, the salaf, when they referred to sunnah, they meant everything in the religion. They referred to that was aqidah and, and included things of fiqh. So they didn't distinguish uh, and, and, and use sunnah to mean something that was mustahab. But instead, that's why Imam Ahmed entitled, he said, Usul sunnah indana. He said the, the foundations of the sunnah to us, meaning the foundation of sunnah it included uh, i'tiqad, it included the creed of Islam and the methodology, the madhab of giving, uh, uh, of da'wah and understanding uh, the religion. And then the shaykh said, so the sunnah it is what has been affirmed uh, on the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam from his statements, from his actions, and from the things that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he agreed to or allowed to uh, 
be, uh, you know, from the things that he, he allowed in his presence. And for example, for, with a sunnah taqrir, taqrir, things like the eating of the dhab uh, by Khalid bin Walid, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Khalid bin Walid, one of the sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who ate uh, dhab and he offered it to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't, uh, didn't partake in it because, you know, it wasn't from his his tradition to eat lizards. That wasn't from his, uh, from his, um, his community or it wasn't known to his, his people. But from Khalid bin Walid, that was known from their people. The, Sun the Prophet ﷺ didn't want to partake in it, but Khalid bin Walid asked, is it halal, ya Rasulullah? Because he was ready to leave it, showing their domestic be sunnah, how the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, how they were. He said, no, it's not. So he, he allowed for him to eat it, letting us know. So that's called sunnah taqreer, meaning that is something the Prophet sallallahu allowed to take place. So that is permissible and that is considered from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although he didn't eat it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those are just some of the uh, benefits uh, that the Imam, that the Sheikh mentioned. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah. Anything I said that was incorrect from myself and the Shaytan.